Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President, for inviting me today. Thank you also for representing a country that has been and is one of the strongest supporters of the refugee cause in your country itself, in Europe, and globally. And uh, members of the Security Council, from where I sit, and no doubt from where you sit as well, times are very challenging. I will focus, of course, on those challenges seen from my perspective. And I would like to flag at the end, at the beginning, at the start, a context in which there is unprecedented stigmatization of refugees and migrants, a context in which traditional responses to refugee crisis appear increasingly inadequate, a context in which there is a sense around this issue of an overwhelming crisis. I think it would be useful before we start to recall for whom this is a crisis. It is a crisis for a mother with her children that is trying to flee from gang violence. It is a crisis for a teenager that wants to flee from war, human rights violation, forced conscription. It is a crisis for governments in countries with few resources that every day open their borders to thousands of refugees. For them, it is a crisis. But to portray this as a global crisis that is not manageable, in my opinion, I'd like to propose, it is wrong. With political will, which you represent here at the highest level, with improved responses as they are enshrined in the Global Compact for Refugees adopted by the General Assembly in December, it is possible and urgent to address these crises. And you, as Security Council, have a critical role, as I have said to you in the past. I'll focus on three areas rapidly. One is the key function of yours, solving peace and security crises. Second, Supporting, cri supporting countries that host the largest numbers of refugees, and third, working together to remove obstacles to solutions, and in particular, to the return of people to their own countries. On the first point, solving peace, working together to solve crises, I'll focus on the situation in, uh, in Libya. But before I go there, let me recall this of the nearly 70 million people that are displaced or refugees, most of them are fleeing conflict. If conflicts were prevented or resolved, most refugee flows would disappear. Still, we observe from where we are very fragmented approaches to peacemaking, very insufficient approaches to peace building. We see a lot of addressing the symptoms without addressing the causes. Libya is a case in point, and it is, I know very well, an issue on your current uh, agenda given the events of the last few days. Let me talk about Libya from our perspective. As you know, together with the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, we're working with internally displaced, Libyans, but also refugees and migrants that are stranded there, who flee, many of them, from other conflicts and find themselves now in a, new, in a new conflict, are caught in another conflict. Security, let me tell you, has always been very fragile in Libya. Now, in the last week, that security, those conditions are getting to breaking points. We have reduced staff, like the rest of the UN. We're not leaving. We don't want to leave if it is possible to stay, but work is very, very difficult and dangerous. I've visited twice, and I've hardly ever felt such a sense of insecurity. We try to gain access, even under these circumstances, to the detention center where refugees and migrants are held, um, and we have been able to relocate 150, I think, uh, yesterday or this morning, to safety, but these are drops in the ocean. So Libya is somehow indicative of the challenges that we face in many conflicts. Yemen, that you discuss so frequently. Insecurity coupled with access issues by our personnel and 
relatively few resources. So most urgent on Libya is your unified action to end the current military escalation and your strong call to spare civilians, including the refugees and migrants that are blocked in the country. And I echo here the appeal made yesterday by the Secretary General. And then, and then, if you are successful, there will need to be finally unified action to address the causes of conflict. It will be more difficult now, but it will be necessary if we want to avoid a protracted conflict, which no doubt will create further displacement and impede any action on refugees and migrants with consequences that are difficult to, to, uh, to predict. It's good to look perhaps at the lessons we've learned in Libya in the past few months. Lots of resources put in re strengthening the Coast Guard to stem the flows towards Europe, not much else by way of investment in bringing peace and stability in the country. This was not effective. The Libyan Coast Guard is not an effective rescuer of people in the sea. And then detention of refugees and migrants is still the prevailing mode in, in the country and uh, in conditions that are horrific and unacceptable. Third, I really think that it is important, and we've learned that lessons, to be more strategic at both ends of these long flows. Look at the root causes, why people are leaving, conflict, poverty, and in Europe, where people inevitably will continue to arrive, try to establish a reception system based on a shared solidarity approach, uh, in spite of the difficult politics around it. My second point is about host countries. Now, I know, we know, that political solutions are not easy in today's world. So we need to be realistic in our expectations. So forced displacement will continue with, to be with us for some time, and we need to manage it well. Some countries have ag adopted very good approaches in partnership with donors, some of you are big donors, but also with development actors like the World Bank and the private sector, Ethiopia. Uganda, Niger, Kenya. We have many very positive examples in Africa, and there's other examples as well, but more often than not, support is insufficient. And I'll take here the case of Venezuela. Now, there's a lot of focus, you've had a lot of focus on what's happening inside Venezuela, and rightly so. And tomorrow, I understand that there will be a special session of the Security Council that will focus on this particular issue. Um, and on that, of course, in that respect, uh, we are aligned with the rest of the UN. I, we must appeal with the others for a political solution to be found quickly for this crisis. But it is important not to forget, and sometimes I'm worried that we're forgetting or you are forgetting, about the other dimension of this crisis, the outflow of people. Three and a half million Venezuelans have left the country. Refugees and migrants, you know, IOM and UNHCR work together because it is a very mixed uh, group of people. Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, uh, Brazil are the most impacted countries, but there's about 15 countries that are receiving uh, uh, Venezuelans. Latin American solidarity, once again, has been outstanding. And as we speak, countries in the region are ending an important meeting in Quito, part of the Quito process to forge more regional cooperation to respond to this country. And I appeal to those countries, in spite of the burden, keep the doors open and uh, diminish the restrictions imposed on Venezuelans. But support for those countries need to increase bilaterally through the United Nations channels. Our appeal for humanitarian crisis in that region is one of the most poorly funded globally, and of course, most important, through the international financial institutions, because failure to do so will leave those governments exposed, also politically, in their own countries, and under the burden of an unsustainable mass of hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans. 85% of the world refugees are in poor or middle-income countries. That's where the crisis is, like in the situation of Venezuela. So support, this is my appeal, must be stepped up. That hospitality must not be taken for granted, as we see in Colombia or Peru, but as we see also in Lebanon, in Bangladesh, I could give you many examples. The Global Compact provides a blueprint for better responses. A blueprint that is not only humanitarian, but uh, is, goes beyond 
to the medium and long term. And a type of response that is key, not only from the humanitarian point of view, but also, and this is your perspective, for the stability of entire region. And hence, directly, it is of your concern. The third and last point I want to raise concerns the fact that solutions to displacement, to forced displacement, exist. Even in difficult circumstances are possible, but we need to work together to remove obstacles, in particular obstacles that prevent people from returning to their countries. And in the context that I have described, we are increasingly challenged by one type of scenario. A scenario where peace is not completely established, but where circumstances evolve in that direction, this very often translates into pressure on refugees to return under less than ideal circumstances, but also it leads to some refugees deciding, in spite of those circumstances, to, uh, to do so. Now, contrary to some perceptions, my organization does not block returns. We don't block return. We think return is a right, but it is equally a right to make the choice not to return if circumstances are not conducive to that, in the absence of security and of basic support. In other words, we want to appeal once more for the free and informed choice of refugees to be respected and for returns to be, as we used uh, uh, almost as a slogan, dignified and secure and safe. And key to this is work that we can do together to uh, remove, uh, remove obstacles to return. A case in point here is, of course, Syria. The vast majority of the almost six million Syrian refugees in the Middle East want to return. They say this to us in our surveys, but not all of them. The majority is still hesitant to do it now. It is important to look at this from the refugee perspective. They have three sets of concern, material concerns, uh, shelters, services, jobs, security concerns, including conscription and retaliation in general, and legal and administrative obstacles related to property and to documentation. We have established on all these matters a fairly constructive dialogue with the government of Syria, and I would like to thank the Russian Federation for having supported this uh, dialogue, but we need faster action faster responses uh, on the part of Syria, and we need access for UNHCR and United Nations staff to the areas where people return to create, to build that confidence that they desperately need to make that very difficult, uh, difficult choice. And meanwhile, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't say that support to the countries hosting refugees, they will host those refugees for some time to come in large numbers, Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, Egypt, Iraq. That support needs to continue. I want to also mention this, that I've done it before with you, the situation in Myanmar. I've spoken several times. Uh, we have, as you know, UNDP and UNHCR, a memorandum of understanding with the government of, of Myanmar since uh, June uh, of last year. The implementation has been very, very slow and made slower by the security situation in northern Rakhine with the offensive of the Arakan army that you are familiar with. And we have recent reports of violence against the civilians that has provoked fresh displacement, which of course is worrying. Now I'm glad to report to you, which I haven't reported, that very recently the government of Myanmar has authorized the implementation of 34 projects. They look like a lot, they are very small compared to what needs to be done. It's hundreds of projects that we should be um, uh, 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 carrying out. It's good to sustain that momentum. I hope to visit Myanmar soon to do just that. Inclusive development encompassing the communities is important. But as I said many times, it's not enough to break that cycle of exclusion, displacement, fragile return that has prevailed for decades. And at the risk of sounding repetitive here, let me repeat, nevertheless, returns must be voluntary. I think everybody agrees on that. And restoring security is key to this, as it is to implement the recommendation of the Rakhine Advisory Commission, especially in terms of pathways to citizenship, documentation, 
access to services, ending the inequality before the law that has been the characteristic of that uh, uh, situation and has affected the Rohingya community. And I think it would be useful to continue to insist that some visible signals are given by the government of Myanmar. Freedom of movement for the Rohingya that are still, that haven't left and are still there or solving the problem of internally displaced people that are confined in camps in very difficult circumstances and tackling the hate speech campaigns that periodically we see in the social media directed against the Rohingya community. In the meantime, just like for Syria, let's not forget that Bangladesh is hosting a million people in difficult circumstances. I'm visiting there with OCHA and IOM uh, in a couple of weeks, and uh, it will be an opportunity for me to recall that we need international support to give dignity and opportunity, at least, to the people that are in a difficult exile. I'll close, uh, Mr. President, with a few remarks that take me to my initial, uh, initial point. I have been, as you may know, an international civil servant, and I have uh, worked with refugees for well over three decades. I have seen in my career, in this field of work, much solidarity, even heroism, in some of the responses that are provided on the ground, with the support of all of you. And make no mistakes, that solidarity is still very strong when I go around the world and talk about this issue, every day, in many countries. But also in these three and a half decades, I have never seen such toxicity, such poison in the language of politics, in media, in social media, even in everyday discussions and conversations around this issue. Toxicity that focuses, sadly, tragically, often on refugees, on migrants, on foreigners. That should be of concern to us all. What we have seen in Christchurch, New Zealand, is the result also of that toxic language of politics. But let's take, by the way, a leaf from the exemplary response of the people and leadership of New Zealand. Respond to these toxic trends in a firm and organized manner. Restate the values that underpin the solidarity that we must provide to refugees and reaffirm as the, as the SDGs do, as the Sustainable Development Goals do, reaffirm that our societies will not be really prosperous, stable and peaceful if they do not include all. Thank you, Mr. President.